People and animals get themselves trapped in the most unlikely places, which might be comical if it wasn't often life-threatening. Just like us, animals sometimes get themselves into awkward situations. When Durham headmaster Jeff Haley took his six-year-old terrier Ben for his walk, the dog's natural inquisitiveness got the better of him. He'd gone exploring in the pipe. I mean, I wasn't too bothered. It's just a storm drain. Uh, gave him a shout, expected him being out. After about 10 minutes and he hadn't come out, I was beginning to realise that something perhaps was wrong. Anxious for Ben's welfare, Jeff and a friend followed the line of the drain, listening for the dog's cries. Friend lent us some tools, lifted the manhole cover. Uh, I went down, couldn't hear anything, but my friend was adamant that there was a, a faint noise, so we decided that it obviously had to be in the direction of the new development. My friend went further onto the estate and found the next manhole cover. Then we heard the noises, that's where the dog was. He was between the next two covers. The situation seemed hopeless. Ben was trapped beneath a new road on a housing development, some half a mile from where he'd entered the storm drain. It was a bank holiday and no builders were around to help. As night fell, the fire brigade arrived to pump water from the drain to prevent Ben from drowning. Eight hours had passed and few people expected a happy ending. Using only pickaxes, Jeff and friends made a desperate bid to save Ben. Obviously the road had to come up and uh, we, we couldn't dig that up unless we got some sort of permission. And we did eventually get permission. We dug by hand. We got down to him, the Lord me down. I cleared a space around his head to make sure that he had air. By dawn the next day, with the help of local residents, Jeff had reached Ben but a lot more earth would have to be shifted in order to dig Ben free. Fortunately for Ben, help was on its way. It was about um, 7.45 on Tuesday morning. Obviously came into our shift. Well, when we arrived on the site, uh, Mr Healy had a little hole in the ground and he managed to get out the pipe and reach a dog, but he couldn't get the dog out, so I had to start digging it out with the machine. My, well, my biggest concern was getting the dog out without actually hurting the dog, because it was only in a little pipe and nothing can do some damage, really. Could have killed the dog no problem, like. Having dug seven feet down and broken through the pipe, Jeff could finally touch and comfort Ben. But his ordeal still wasn't over. Tried to pull it out by its head, but the pipe's on a shot of the light razor blades anyway, so we had to pull it from the back. Obviously not to cut it through it or whatever. I put my hand in to make sure there was no sharp edges on the pipe, and he just pulled them by the tail, and out he came. Uh, filthy and a little bit tired, but basically none the worse for his, his ordeal. Yes! Good dog, Ben. It had taken 19 hours, but at last, Ben was free. There's a boy. Good dog. Cushions driver who's uh, a damn fine driver. He's part of the family. And, uh, yeah, you know, I wouldn't like to be without him. He's more rested in the pipe. I'm sorry. Good dog. In this week's 999 demonstration, Mark Cass will find out what it's like to be part of an emergency evacuation. But these aren't real passengers, and this isn't a real plane. Looking forward to your holiday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me too. This is Cranfield University near Milton Keynes. At the psychology department, they've been doing research into aircraft evacuation for 15 years. Aircraft accidents are, in fact, incredibly rare, but nevertheless, we do still have fatalities. And the main reason we have fatalities is because if there's a fire, there's usually only two minutes from the initial spark to the conditions in the cabin being non-survivable. 
Marx joined a group of volunteers who will act as passengers in today's experiment. Before they start, they're weighed, measured, and given a quick medical. Can I ask what sort of uh, exercise you take? Uh, just uh, general exercise, you know, falling off buildings, setting myself on fire. Right. <laughs> Because of the cramped conditions in the cabin, we're using miniature cameras to help record the experiment. There's a little camera, secret camera in here, in the uh, tie. You probably, well, it would be impossible to see from where you are now, but I'll actually put my finger to it. See that little hole there? There's actually um, a hole in the material and a little camera inside that. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board. Can I sit in there? Cheers. Any light articles that you've bought aboard the Thanks aircraft very much. should be placed in the overhead bins right in front of you. This mock-up of a Boeing 737 cabin holds 60 passengers, otherwise the layout is exactly the same as in a normal aircraft. To make the experience as realistic as possible, the passengers are greeted by cabin crew and go through the normal pre-flight safety briefing. The only difference is that they all know at some point there'll be an emergency order to evacuate the plane. For the first experiment, the passengers have been told that when the order to evacuate comes, they should stay calm, try and help each other, and do exactly what the cabin crew tell them. Under your seatbelt, get out. Under your seatbelt, and come this way! Come on, stick as you can now! Jump! Rear the cabin. Jump! Jump! Keep moving! Jump! <laughs> Quick as you can. Go, go, go. Jump. Jump. Go, go, jump, go. go. Jump. Jump. Keep moving. Come on. Jump. 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 Keep moving. Come on now. Jump. 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 Come on. Keep moving as quick as you can. Jump. 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 Keep moving. Come on. Jump. 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 This is a highly successful evacuation. All 60 passengers got out of the plane in less than a minute. So that, to me, seemed like a pretty good evacuation. How did you find yeah, it your first really, time out? Really good, actually. You know, everyone was fairly kind to each other. You know, we couldn't have got out down the exit any uh, slide quicker. any more quicker yeah. than that. In fact, I was so quick, I actually ended up um, stomping on a girl's hand and the girl behind me just sort of slightly crashed into me so I need to apologize to the girl mm. but I crashed mm. into her but, but, but if by going at that speed everybody got out and say and lived it wouldn't be well, these minor injuries are yeah um, not a big issue I feel now the researchers want to make the conditions much more like a real emergency they've offered a simple incentive a five pounds cash bonus to the first 30 passengers to escape how will they behave this time these are the two doors at the rear of the cabin. Floor level lighting will illuminate. Showing the route. Looking around exit. now, where is that emergency exit? You know, they all know it's coming. Demonstrated. There is also an additional overwing emergency exit located in the centre of the cabin. Under your seatbelt, get out. The whistle means the researchers have abandoned the experiment. The situation was getting dangerous. I think that was a good decision, actually. <laughs> that crush was real. The volunteers weren't acting. The offer of the cash bonus made people competitive and aggressive, just like in a real emergency. That was just ridiculous. It was just, um, everyone just went absolutely mad. 
there was a guy going over the top and the person underneath was getting crushed and the air hostess was already trying to pull him out and I was worried it was going to get worse and someone was going to get hurt. And that's interesting because in fact in the accident which happened at Manchester Airport in 1985 that's exactly what happened at that location. Everyone panicked like mad. Everyone went over the seats and there was this massive jam at, at, the, at the final exit, the door of the exit. And I, I actually did see, I got kicked in the shoe and everything. So, you know, it was just mayhem, mayhem. I, I asked all the big men, you got some seven stone, eight stone women there, please look after them, don't hurt anybody. So every male was told that today and you, you can still see their behavior. It's, they were asked to play cool and it's crazy. You know, it just makes far more sense just going out in, in the orderly, um, in an orderly line rather than just being aggressive. It just created more problems for everyone, including the people that were being aggressive. Remember, all it took was a five-pound bonus to turn an orderly queue into a fight for survival. And this experiment didn't have any of the smoke, flames and panic of a real emergency. So what lessons can be learned from these two evacuations? I think, for me, one of the things we're starting to learn from the research is that it's the cabin crew become increasingly important as the problems and the conditions deteriorate. Yeah. Is that yeah. how it felt? Yeah, absolutely. That person shouting out the back door, for me, was the person that saved a lot of people's lives in that situation. People can do a lot to help themselves in aircraft emergencies. Contrary to the public perception, in the majority of aircraft accidents, some or all of the passengers do survive, and the survivors are the people who, when they've sat on the aeroplane, have looked at where they are, have worked out where their nearest exits are and where, if that's not working, their alternate exits might be. They've studied the safety card and they're well prepared and they can believe that they can get out and they're positive. Coming up on 999, A&E faces a bed crisis and a very unusual surf rescue. Really? Sailing around the world to start a new life, it's a dream, isn't it? But Marilyn and Maurice Bailey decided to make that dream come true and embark on the voyage of a lifetime. But Marilyn and Morris's dream went dreadfully wrong. It became an ordeal that lasted 119 days, that's nearly four months, and required every ounce of their courage and endurance to live through. Their story starts in Southampton as they set sail on an adventure that was to become one of the most remarkable survival stories in maritime history. Well, I'd always loved the sea, but I'd never had much contact with it until I met Morris, who had done a lot of sailing, and um, that was something we decided we could do together. Our boat was a 33-foot sloop, of, well, very much like this one here. Yeah, it's very similar. Uh, built of wood, of course, and um, we called her Orlin. That was the mixture of our two names, Morris and Marilyn. And we paired her for this very extensive voyage to New Zealand. Mm. The feel of New Zealand was, it was a country on the far side of the world and um, the adventure of getting there w was the greatest appeal for us. Mm. Yes, we, this is one thing we always wanted to go there and we just, a pity we didn't. They arrived in Panama after seven months. From there they set out to cross the Pacific with enough provisions to last them for nine months. We were seven days out from Panama and we were sailing along very pleasantly. One early morning, we passed this whaling ship. How's that coffee doing, love? Don't worry, it's on its way. <laughs> we were below decks preparing everything for breakfast. When there was a terrific crash against the side of the boat. Every timber shock. I'll go up on deck and have a look. We rushed out on deck to see the wild antics of a very wounded whale. That must have hit us. Oh, look at the mess in this place. I think we're going to have to abandon ship. We had lots of things on board, very personal things, a lot of wedding presents, various things that we were taking with us. And then when you have to abandon a boat, the difficulty is, what do you take? 
Morris and Marilyn began an orderly evacuation, not knowing how long they'd have to rely on their expertise and instinct to survive. Oh, all the labels are coming off the cans! They had no radio on board, so were unable to send a distress call. Everything depended on these moments. Is that the last bag? Bye, well, one of the things I had collected from the boat was the camera. And as we sat in the dinghy and the boat was um, obviously sinking, um, I started to snap off shots with the camera. I don't really think I knew what I was consciously looking at, taking shots. I just snap, snap, snap. When the boat finally went down, it was, it was difficult to um, imagine what kind of environment we'd now placed ourselves into. We were sunk by the whale at that point. Our plan was to row due south, to be taken by the wind and current to the Galapagos Islands. So for three days and for three nights, we rowed. We rowed and rowed and rowed. But the winds and currents were too strong for us. After three days, we realised we'd failed and we were going to drift past the Galapagos Islands. Aghast at the realisation we were afloat on an ocean covering a third of the Earth's surface. We couldn't picture it, really. And around us, especially during the hot period, all that was around us was the shimmering heat of the sea reflecting the, the sun back to us. Supplies of food and water were almost exhausted, and they realised they'd have to look to the sea to support them. The first animal we caught was a turtle, and to butcher it was appalling. Then we had to eat its flesh, and it was most difficult. We were, had never eaten raw flesh before, and we were revolted by it all. But we were so hungry by that time, we had to eat it. And we, at, we caught its blood. And when the blood had congealed, we ate it as though it was a, a jelly. And we caught, ate everything after that turtle. We had left the fish hooks out of our emergency pack in Panama. So Mullen evolved this brilliant idea of bending safety pins into hooks and we used that those pins to fish and the, the fish became the mainstay of our diet thereafter that's a brilliant idea though <laughs> we've got something oh, hang on this one here oh you beauty get in there oh it worked <laughs> <laughs> Once we had dis discovered how to catch them with a little safety pin and string, catching the fish was not a problem, and killing the fish and gutting them was not a problem. The problem came in actually eating raw fish. You're not going to eat it, are you? Well, of course I am. They're rich in minerals, love. We've used up all our vitamins, all our food. We've got to get our minerals from somewhere. After about the seventh day, we saw a ship. I saw a ship that was so close. If you can picture as on the surface of the sea, the curvature of the Earth meant that our horizon was only two miles away. So that ship was less than two miles away from us. Marilyn? What? Marilyn, give me the flares. I think there's a ship out there. We fired our flares at it. <laughs> and it sailed on completely ignored us, or nobody saw us at all. It never occurred to me that we would not survive, and I always thought we would be rescued quite quickly. But when the first uh, boat had gone past in the very few days, then I began to realise that it was very difficult for other vessels to see us. They saw several ships, but appearing as a speck on the horizon, they couldn't be spotted. They tried using all their resources to make themselves be seen. <laughs> It's no use, love. Nothing's happening. It will, Morris. Just keep trying. I'm sure it'll turn. 
They were now entering the doldrums, an area near the equator feared by sailors for its calms, sudden storms and unpredictable winds. The heat now gave way to cold and rain. As we drifted into the doldrums, we found great relief from the blistering heat that we'd had previously. Now we had overcast skies, wet, rain, and terrible cold. And it started to rain. And we didn't know when it would rain again, so we collected every bit we could. And we collected it off the side of the life raft, which washed all the rubberized coating off the life raft. And the uh, water was contaminated thereafter with this rubberized coating. But it was glorious, we had this wonderful water, and we could digest our protein now. I think we'll have to ration ourselves to half another day each from now on. Sorry. Well, we always seem to be um, aware that when one person felt depressed for any particular reason, the other one would try to bolster their spirits and, and probably begin to speak about a topic that would we knew would be very interesting and would make them a bit happier. There you are, Morris. I've just designed us our next boat for when we get home. Home? Yes, home. Look, love, we've got as much fish as we can eat, we've got water, and we are going to get rescued. Believe me. I believe you, love. <laughs> Morris and Marilyn had been adrift for two months with only rainwater to drink and the food they could catch. But there were more troubles along the way. No! What's up? On the 50th day, the dinghy was punctured. What? I don't believe it. Pass me the pump. It became a constant chore to keep the dinghy afloat. The life raft had also been damaged by the spines of a trigger fish. Their means of survival were gradually perishing, and with it, their hopes of being rescued. To make matters worse, it was almost impossible to keep themselves out of the salt water. OK, yeah. OK, all right. I think it's only a... As we sat in our life raft, we were never free of water, and gradually we developed saltwater sores that grew deeper and deeper. I think a thrombosis developed in my leg, and gradually that clot gradually went round to my lung, and I inhaled it, and I coughed it out. And coughing it out, I coughed part of my lung out as well. I, I suppose anybody on land would have been rushed to hospital and um, been under intensive care in that state, but I had to endure it for days without any help at all. Oh, there you go, that's it. There you go. I thought, you know, maybe this is where I'm going to die. Listen, we're going to get out of here, we're going to get rescued, and you're going to get better. It never occurred to me that he would die. And it, it was a thought that I, I didn't really want to think about, that I would be there on my own. We'd started this voyage together, and I was really quite determined we'd finish it together. I think the will to survive is very strong in some people and not in others. I, I do believe it's stronger in the female of the species rather than the male. But. Um, I didn't think that I was, it was my time to die, and I was determined that we would survive if it was at all possible. Our 119th day at sea began like all the others. We fished from dawn, we consumed our fish. And then, sometime in the afternoon, Marlon roused me. She said, I can hear a ship. Morris? Morris, there's a boat! There's a boat out there! I, I had very sharp hearing, and I did hear the sound, or the engine, Hello. the sound of an engine. And almost you didn't believe it, because we hadn't heard ships for quite a long time. But there was this little thump, 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 and I knew a, a ship was out there somewhere. We had no flares, we had nothing. All we could do was wave. And as I thought, as I thought, it sailed on. And I dropped on my knees in despair. I remember saying to Marlon, 
Let it go on. Save your strength. This is our life now, on the sea, amongst the fishes and the birds and the turtles. It's coming back, Morris. Morris, it's coming back. I hear it, look. And I looked up, and sure enough, this ship was it's coming back. It's coming back. Hello! 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 It's seen us! It's seen us! When we were actually rescued, we had the, the hardest part was climbing up the ladder up the side of the vessel. But, um, you know, he was rescued, so you, the adrenaline goes and you, you do it. But when we got on the deck, all, all we could do was sit down. Um, we hadn't been standing up or moving around for four months. And our leg muscles were quite wasted and we couldn't take any pressure on them. And I think we more or less crawled onto the deck and just happy just to sit there on a blanket. They were picked up on the 119th day, which meant Morris and Marilyn had been adrift for nearly four months. There's no record to this day of anyone having survived being adrift for so long. We survived, I think, because we, had, we were tolerant of each other. We lived as a team and we worked as a team. And we, there was nothing that embittered our relationship during that time. And I think that was the reason we survived. On really today at five. The shortage of hospital beds has been a familiar news story in recent years. Bristol Royal Infirmary's accident and emergency department has often been at the sharp end of that bed crisis. It's the major A and E department in the area, dealing with around 40% of emergencies in Bristol. That's about a thousand patients a week, and around 200 of them have to be admitted for further treatment. Until beds can be made available on the wards, that means they have to stay here, in A&E. It's really numb, that's the thing. This week on A&E, a budding artist comes in with a bad hand injury. And the police are called in to handle a difficult patient. It's the start of another shift at A&D, and clinical nursing manager Pete Salt is not having a good day. Awful. In a word, dreadful. And it's getting worse. Why is it so Patients are all being looked after, there's no problem with that. It's just we've got no beds to put them into. But the patients keep coming. All right, then. Let's see if I touch your right hand. Yeah, not badly. Are you right-handed or left-handed? Right. Laurie Sitzia, an aspiring artist, has just arrived, having cut her hand on a broken wine bottle while working in a bar. Oh, God, that is disgusting, Painful. isn't it? Okay. No, it doesn't hurt. Okay. It's really no. Yeah. Oh! It's my birthday on Friday. I'm not happy about this. We've got to about here. Where this Away from the hospital, and Annie Hatherley, who was in A&D 12 days ago after being kicked by her horse, is recovering well at home. And I think, I don't know, but I think she must have bucked as she went, and as I fell, I think I sort of got the full buck in the face. Polly, Polly! <whistles> Polly! Are you still friends? Yeah, I think so. I think it was an accident. She, she isn't a horse who kicks at all. They were brilliant. They put me back together and I didn't. I have minimal pain. All healed up very quickly, but uh, everything should be able to be repaired and I can smile. <laughs> back at the BRI and Pete Salt has just found out that one of Bristol's other A&D departments at Southmead Hospital has closed. They're closed now to emergency admissions because they've got no beds in the hospital. So that means that we will now be getting all the emergency admissions for that hospital as well. But the biggest irony is that we, as you've seen, haven't got any beds here either. But the policy of this hospital is that we never, ever close. 
I appreciate the sort of politics of it, but what I need to know is that are we going to be getting ambulances coming in from South Peter's catchment area? I mean, that's obviously having an impact on my department. Pete has to inform the rest of the staff of the worsening situation, including the A&D consultant, Aoife O'Sullivan. We're obviously going to help South Mead and offer to help if we possibly can. Prepare for a larger influx for us again. As you, Pete was saying, we have still a lot of people waiting for beds here. And they say they're close to ambulances for two hours, but the knock-on effect won't really hit us for another hour, and it'll probably go on for three or four hours after that. We will cope, but um, when we get the beds, I don't know. We'll get the beds, don't worry. To make matters worse, there are now three patients in the resuscitation bay. One patient has hypothermia, another has suffered a serious stroke. Been brought in with breathing difficulties. He was just very short of breath and he lives in the elderly people's home and so they just brought him in because he hadn't long been home, having spent six weeks in here just before Christmas. I've been here ever since we're waiting for a Batman. The resuscitation area is for seriously ill people. Each patient has at least one dedicated nurse, a doctor, and a supervising consultant. This, together with the lack of beds and the closure of Southmead, means that A and D is now on the limit. It takes one one staff per person, so I mean that's three people down the shop floor then. So the, the queue keeps, still keeps happening. People still keep coming in, and we've got to deal with it. Not very nice. It's not very nice. Anymore. Meanwhile hand injury is turning out to be worse than first expected. That doesn't seem like my hand, that seems like, um, it looks like, just doesn't look real. It's like it's stuck on. <laughs> Scrape my finger on that side, and now on this side too. I've got to be absolutely sure that they're all OK, because you don't want to leave anybody with any form of deficit. I need to have plastic surgery on it. Well, that, they the BRI's hand clinic is full. So going to be transferred to Frenchay Hospital, where her wound can be more closely assessed and repaired by a specialist plastic surgeon. The patient with hypothermia is making a steady recovery, and at last some beds are starting to come free. Can now be moved out. He was extremely ill when he first came in, um, and we stabilised him very well, and now he's in the, you know, in the major end of the department, but you know, he's not in a critical bay of the department. The bed crisis is continuing. Consultant Nigel Rawlinson, along with the clinical nurse manager Pete Salt and A&E manager Anne Pittman, are concerned about the problem. All we need is that radio to go off now to say we're incoming, we'll be within five minutes yeah. with two critically injured children and the mother. We would have been unable to care for them. We would be getting the staff. That would be a major problem. I mean, quite a lot of the wards are struggling as it is. It's, it's not a hit discussion. It's not really having... It is basically voicing everybody's frustration. The problem is everybody's frustrated. It's not, it's not this hospital. It's, you know, at the moment it's current throughout the whole country. The people are just waiting a very long time on trolleys. Yeah, our, our job now with the team of governance is to alert risk management. Men. Indeed. We can't do our job. Yes. So we've done that, I guess. And ask you in the past of B to recognise that it adds major extra stress onto a job that's already stressful. You look like a worried woman, Anne. Oh, so do I? No, no, not at all. Just a, a minor hiccup and later on today the beds will come up, patients will be in them, and things will come back to normal. It is stressful for the department uh, when we have so many sick patients who are waiting for beds. We couldn't have looked after them. We couldn't, we couldn't have shot them within 90 seconds. I suppose the bottom line of it is we have no control over the amount of sick people that come into hospital. We can't say no, and obviously they come in, they need to come in, they need to be admitted, so that's where the problems lie. In reception, there's still a large backlog of people waiting for treatment. If it's busy, and obviously they're, they're waiting an awfully long time, they keep coming up and asking, you keep explaining about the wait. But unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about it, because you might try and explain there's an awful lot of really sick people, or we've got people in the recess room. They can't relate to that. All they're interested in is what, what's wrong with them, really. Unfortunately, one patient has become very agitated.
I've tried to, I've tried to talk to him. The man who wants treatment now has threatened staff and is being very abusive. Both hospital security and the police have been called in to help resolve the situation. His problem is that he's got an old injury to his leg and it's an old injury and it's not nothing new. He wants it fixed and he's got an appointment with the orthopaedic clinic. So. Did he have a go at you? Yeah, he had a go at me. He had a go at um, uh, Nick as well. In the end, the police decided to remove the man from the hospital. She's arrived at Frenchay Hospital, where she'll have an operation tonight. She'll also need to take eight weeks off work. It's all become a rather drawn-out affair for her. Eventually, the bed crisis receded. Southmead reopened, and the BRI survived another day. And how often does this kind of thing happen? Regularly. I don't know how often. Um, no, not every night, but most days there'll be some problem with beds or a, a transient hiccup in beds, but it usually clears itself. Nearly always clears itself by the evening. Our next story is not about the victim, but the rescuer. David Hurst received a Queen's commendation for bravery for a highly unusual rescue when he went to the aid of a surfer who became stranded 150 metres off the beach at Borth, West Wales. Um, the sea can be the most dangerous place on earth, but if you treat it right and you go out and you know what you're doing, it's fine. I swim during the day, I swim at night. It, it just doesn't really matter, just any time, really. I just love it. Aaron was down with me bodyboarding. We get quite a number of surfers when the, when the waves are good. It's never been one of my better things. My balance isn't very good. I left Aaron on the beach with some friends and his mum. I was just playing. All I saw I did is just started going out to sea. I decided to go out for a swim. There was a strong southwesterly wind. The surf was up, it was about a metre or so high. I prefer it when it's a bit rougher, it's a bit more interesting. was somebody shouting for help. I couldn't see anything out there. I shouted out, are you all right? Please, help! And they shouted back, I can't get back in. I just started to swim out. I didn't know how far they were because the waves were quite big. Keep shouting, mate, I can't hear you! Help! I had to keep this conversation going in order to be able to find him. When I got there, he was exhausted. He'd obviously been out for quite some time and had tried a number of things to get in and just could get it nowhere. It was his first time he'd been out on a board and really the conditions on that day were not for a beginning surfer. And I said, what you're trying to do is to come straight in and this beach doesn't allow you to come straight in. You've got to come in at an angle. So I said, keep hold of the board, and I took him at an angle towards the beach further down. You can feel the waves taking you back out. You realise how much in control the sea is. All of a sudden, I felt the seabed beneath us. We got on the beach, some 200 yards or so further along. I needed rescuing then, if you like. I said to him, could you tell me where we are? 
I said, what are the buildings that are near us? And he says, why is there salt in your eyes? I said, no, they just don't work. Because I'm blind. There was this stunned silence. It was as though he was struck dumb. And I said, can you take me back to my son? I remember walking along the beach and him thanking me for what happened and all these emotions are going through and I'm sure the same was happening to him. Help! My dad was trying to find me and, and then I ran over to him with his sunglasses. Yeah. I think he was brave to get him out of the sea. And then the surfer went and that was it, and never saw him again. My condition is retinal cone dystrophy. I see complete white out. I love to take him down to the water because he can't see. What's different about me and my dad is his surfer sinks and but he doesn't. The strange thing is, when I get back onto dry land, I'm disabled because I fall over things, trip over things and bump into things. But in the sea, I was the able-bodied person and he was disabled because he didn't know what to do.